So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharap Jin. It's actually my yogi name, and most people in Japan call me Jin because it's just easier. Today, I'm going to talk about I rename a little bit. I call it Echo Flow Renaissance, and we'll talk more about it as I go on. I believe we're all here today because we care a lot about the environment. And as we're speaking here, there's wild bushfire going on in Australia. There's also deforestation going on in Brazil. And we all know that carbon emission is increasing at an alarming rate. But what can we really do about it? You know, when I was young, I watched this um, series by National Geographic. It's called Six Degrees Could Change the World. And with, with every incremental change in the temperature, um, a lot of species would disappear. And eventually, people, we would go extinct as well if we reach about 4 degrees Celsius. I was very helpless back then, but I didn't know what we could do about it. Um, there's a lot of, I didn't know when I was young, I didn't know what I wanted to study in university. I didn't know what I wanted to work as after I graduate. I didn't know why we're even here um, today or why we're born into this earth. But eventually there were many formative events in my life that provided meaning to my uh, perspective. Um, in 2013, I went to Fukushima for the first time in Japan to volunteer in an evacuation center. This is in Iwaki. And there are two main uh, biggest takeaways from Fukushima. The first thing is that um, in the face of death, speaking with all those survivors, there's only two things that matter. First one is that we really want to live on. <laughs> we don't want to die. And the second thing is... Um, Kizuna, or the connections we have with people, and they care most about their families who are um, either um, perished or they might be working in a different place. And so it made me reflect a lot about life. Death made me think more about living. And um, I decided to come to Japan to study. But before coming to Japan, I took another transformative turn to Ladakh, um, a place high up in the Himalayas, um, just a week before I left to Japan, actually for my study abroad. And this is in Ladakh, in Chantang. And I was, all of a sudden, I was surrounded by nature. I walked to different places, different regions. Um, this is Pangong Lake. Um, we volunteered in a school, speaking to people, um, children, kids. And it was probably one of the happiest moments in my life. It made me reflect a lot um, about my life. And these are the questions that I kept thinking, you know. Um, combining Fukushima and Ladakh, you know, I was thinking when I'm on my deathbed, will I feel fulfillment? Um, do I feel fulfillment throughout my life? What gives me meaning in life? And have I grown as a person? Have I loved? Have I, um, was I given love? And am I contributing to the world or at least not destroying it? So I came to Japan um, for three years. I studied abroad in China in between for a year in Peking University. And I took liberal arts education because obviously I didn't know what I wanted to study back then. And I was exploring a lot of stuff. But I kept reconnecting with Ladakh because I felt very natsukashi, very nostalgic about my experience back then. And I messaged the NGO that we visited to see how I could help. And we came up with posters to help garner uh, volunteers to help them out. Um, in fact, I was liaising with Gurmet. He's here today. He's a Ladakhi. And over the years, he's moved over to Japan and fate has brought us together. Um, and the thing about Ladakh is it eventually helped me found an answer to some of the questions of, on how we can help. Um, the book is called Ancient Futures. Is, um, when I was studying in Japan, I kept studying about Ladakh and I found this book. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the whole content of the book, but just the gist of it. It talks about um, a circular zero waste economy in Ladakh that um, it's based on indigenous wisdom. There's no plastics um, initially. It's very much need-based and communal-based. People will farm together and um, help one another. And there's not much of money involved in that society. But later on, after the 70s, when the dot started opening up to the world, capitalism started seeping in, and people started comparing wealth, comparing money. They gave up farming to go to work in the city. And the happiness levels started dropping. The suicide rate among youths in Ladakh is alarming these days. And it's more of a greed base, individualistic. Um, and actually, we're all part of this capitalistic neoliberal economy today. So this is in Ladakh uh, back in the 70s. You can still see this in lo a lot of places, but not in Leh, which is the capital of Ladakh. And if you go to Leh today, it's just 
filled with lots of plastics and garbages because people don't know what to do with these plastics. Um, I was just in a conference recently with Helena um, a few weeks ago, um, and she was talking about the importance of understanding the big picture. And Helena is the author of Ancient Futures. Um, we have to rethink about our global economy because, you know, if we look at trade, global trade today, a lot of things are unnecessary or very irrational. Mexican cows, for example, were fed American corn and exported to the United States, where they're cute there and sent back to Mexico for consumption. But why are we doing this? Because governments are subsidizing trade in a very irrational way. Or Britain and Australia exchanging 20 tons of bottled water for what? Um, or Alaska uh, meat being processed in China and sent back to the US. And so you can check out more of these facts on um, just how insane is trade these days on the Local Futures website. Uh, as our economy has turned into this wow, um, insane global trade, most people are, un un are unhappy these days. Half of all workers in America state that they're unhappy and most wanted to quit or have a very negative view of their work or their employer. In fact, a lot of people today, they dread waking up in the morning, they feel bored during the day in school, at work, they feel tired in the evening, and they can't sleep at night. What is wrong with our society today? Helen, Helena suggests that the big picture solution is localization, that we have to start supporting foods that are grown, produced, manufactured in your local region. All right, that's good, but it needs two different aspects. We need government to support subsidizing, localizing um, the food and the products, at the same time, we need personal commitment because if we as consumers don't vote with our money, then the, the governments wouldn't listen. If everyone stops consuming McDonald's and consume more of organic um, cafes that are local in Japan, perhaps they would grow more and then McDonald's would eventually die out. Yeah. Um, and we need to rethink about how we shop. Do we need to buy things that are unnecessary? And so in order to do this, I think we need a lot of conscious awareness of our intention and action all the time. But how do we cultivate more mindfulness or just sort of awareness in people? Um, in 2017, I decided to take a yoga teacher training course in Thailand and eventually became a yoga teacher. There we studied a lot about anatomy, about philosophy, and yoga philosophy really impacted the way I viewed life later on. Um, this is something we learned in yoga. Um, the human body is consisted, consists of five to seven layers, from the physical to the energetic, our breath, to the emotional, intellectual, psychological, and into the inner bliss or spiritual layers. And we're starting to impact the physical layers and going all the way in to the spiritual layers. So it's like a resonating um, pendulum. If you could improve your breath or improve your health, then it would improve your emotions and um, eventually make you a more spiritual person. And then, by creating balance on each of those chefs, we can eventually create a harmonious relationship with the environment and with the people around us. And so after coming back from the teacher training, I commit to a daily mindfulness practice, yoga and mind, um, mindfulness meditation. I switched to a plant-based diet, and I also wrote a final thesis paper related to mind and body. I practice every day and I reflect and reflect. Um, I became an experiment. In fact, we are all an experiment in and of ourselves. I became happier, more mindful, and I also became a minimalist. But then I questioned myself, why did I become a minimalist so easily? How did that transition happen? And why aren't most people becoming more minimalist? I reflected. And I reflect on my own childhood. Throughout my whole life, as a kid, I competed competitively in badminton. In high school, I did martial arts and competed as well. In university, I took up horseback riding, I took up Aikido, yoga, um, and I enjoyed reading, studying. What do all these activities have in common? Uh, they're all basically experience-oriented. And so um, what I was looking for throughout my life was an altered state of consciousness, which I call flow. And flow is this concept uh, by this pioneer, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, a state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people would do it even at great cost. Um, these are the things that people often lease when they state how they get into flow, like traveling, um, reading a good book, writing a good piece, exercising, watching a good movie, eating a great meal, etc. And it's this 
sweet spot between anxiety and boredom because if something is too challenging, you become anxious about it. If something's too easy, you become bored um, of it over time. So we always need to grow ourselves in order to be in flow all the time. There are several characteristics of um, getting into flow states. The first one is that you have to be focused um, and mindful at the same time. That means you need to be focused yet relaxed. Um, mindfulness is important. And then by merging your intention, your awareness with the action, the self disappears and you're so involved in the task. And you could feel that time either passes quickly or slowly and you feel as though you're in control of your thoughts and your actions. And it becomes very rewarding. It's a pleasurable feeling you get after that. Stephen Kotler says that if you want to get into flow, the challenge should be roughly 4% greater than your skills so that you're at least learning something. So let's say if you're reading a book, if someone gives you a book with a lot of words that you don't understand, you probably wouldn't enjoy it. But if you read something with at least 4% that you don't know, you could find out the dictionary and you could still enjoy the, the gist of it. Uh, just an example. Um, and then there's this idea of strive for greater complexity. Um, we're always trying to adding, try to add more things into this flow experience. So let's say for me, I did martial arts and I was thinking, how can I improve my physical body in different ways? And that's how I get into yoga. So if you want to get into flow, you need to always invest your attention or psychic energy in new and challenging goals. And fulfillment ultimately depends on growing complexity. But wait, what does this have to do with environmentalism? I believe that if you've experienced flow or true fulfillment from happiness, you're less likely to be scammed by immediate gratifying materialism. And so if you really want to make the world a better place, you have to invest first in making yourself happy. And by that I meant true happiness. I believe happiness can be divided into three different categories. One is just a pleasurable state. One is a being, um, a, full, a fullness of um, sensation or contentment, inner peace, when you're just doing nothing, but you enjoy that state. Or fulfillment, when you do something challenging and you um, gain something out of it, you gain growth, you gain connection, contribution, then you get into flow. And so flow is a combination of that state of being and fulfillment, I believe. And so it's different from just eating um, sweet chocolates and getting the pleasure because it doesn't really bring fulfillment in the long run. Um, but flow, of course, doesn't guarantee an echo transformation, but I believe it is an important first step in helping with that transition towards sustainability. Um, Batman Sir Fuller said, you never change, change things by fighting the existing reality, you change something by building a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this model that I propose is called an echo flow renaissance. I use renaissance because, and not revolution, because I don't like industrial revolution. I love the renaissance era during the, um, back in the 16th century when people are engaged in creative um, work, architectural art and everything. And so to have a sy systemic change, we first need a personal change. And in order to create sustainability of our mother earth, we need to create inner sustainability. And what kind of sustainability? We start from the health, the breath and the energy, the emotions, our awareness, attention, and to becoming a more spiritual person. And then we connect with other people in a harmonious way and with the universe. Um, I listed it down here. So my main message is really first, find flow, find happiness and in experiences instead of materialism. Grow, connect with people, love is happiness. This is a study made in Harvard that eventually the, the happiest people in their 80s are people who have the best or living relationships with people around them. Um, contribute big or small, you can start with supporting localization. You know, check the tag every time you buy something, where is it produced and um, become a minimalist, reduce meat. Um, and of course, help other people grow. Um, Seth Godin says that art is the ability to change people with your work, to see things as they are, and then create stories, images, and interactions that can change the marketplace. I believe we all here are artists, and we can do a change from ourselves. Um, I have like five more minutes. Is that right? We have a few more minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking if maybe you can, you can ask me questions after my presentation or later on. I'll just continue, because this is just um, the ending. So. After I graduate from Waseda, I, um, Gurmet and I, we started a social enterprise that's called Viral Life Academy. And this year we registered an NGO in Ladakh um, called Spala Foundation. And we bring people on expeditions to Ladakh where they learn about flow um, through yoga, through Tai Chi, all kinds of mindfulness practices. And we connect them with local people and we go to nomadic schools to help them out. 
Um, but it's also quite interesting how Gramet and I came to this um, collaboration together because he married a Ladakhi girl who came to Japan since she was, high, she was in high school eventually. And then we met up quite often in Japan. We met our first time um, back in 2014 when I visited there. And we kept discussing on how we can use our skills to create a platform to do something different. And that's how we created Vera and Spao. Um, so we have Vera Spao, and I'm also writing a personal blog. I'm launching it next week, actually. These are some of the pictures we took in Ladakh, doing yoga, the kids in the nomadic school. Um, so there's nothing there, but people are very happy, and they play sports every day, so they're always in flow, actually. And uh, apart from the summer programs in Ladakh, I also teach yoga in Beijing, in Japan, <coughs> sometimes in Taiwan, Malaysia. And during my free time, I sometimes learn about permaculture, about farming. Um, this was in Nagano very recently, in Ladakh. And so Helena says that if our starting point is a respect for nature and people, which is basically um, echo and flow, I believe, diversity is an inevitable consequence. If technology and the needs of the economy are our starting point, then we have what we are faced with today, a model of development that is dangerously distanced from the needs of particular peoples and places and rigidly imposed from the top down. We need to reimpose that from the down to the top. So brief and join the echo flow renaissance. Take the leap, okay? The end. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Yes, please. Could you speak a little bit more about this project of yours? Because um, you showed like one slide with like three something. Yes. So we started with Vera Life Academy, um, the social enterprise, where we brought people there um, to learn about yoga, meditate, track, and we channeled the profits, we need to channel the profits, part of the profits to the people, local people there to support localization, the organic farmers. And so we created another NGO this year to help channel the, the funds. Um, and so every summer we bring people um, to Ladakh from different parts of the world. This year we had people from eight different countries. And we, had, we have another video to show that, but I might show it tomorrow during the leadership booth so that I don't take up much more time here. Yeah, and then Shrub Jing, which is my website, is basically just talking about echo flow, and um, I might start a podcast or something. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's not so much a question, but comment. I'm really amazed by uh, your talk and really fascinated, and I uh, can relate to many things, especially in the process you described and your decisions to uh, make some change and to focus on what you can do for yourself and you know, in the first place. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I would say just as a job, I agree on everything but chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, chocolate is good. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, the more seriously, it's um, uh, somehow, it's more personal comment here, but I kind of came to the conclusion that there was not much to evolve from the any government or anything, and so I've been taking a pass of doing things on my own scale and for, you know, um, hoping that everyone, if everyone was doing this for every share, we would get to something. Mm -hmm. But in your description, you explain that in order to uh, achieve properly this localization project, we do need the support of any government. And I'm kind of wondering how we can we really get that, except by changing our consumers' habits. Yep. And then it would make the system crash somehow. Right. If we don't need that. Mm -hmm. I think we need two efforts. We have to change ourselves by consuming wisely, and then we also have to lobby for the right policies um, from the government. And a lot of people are actually not aware of all those insane global trade that is going on, and we need more people to spread this. So I believe it's a very good opportunity here for us to connect with one another, to create a community, and that we could meet up um, from time to time, engage in flow activities together, and to spread the message and grow this community. I have a question if nobody, anybody wants to jump in. Uh, it's fascinating what you're talking about, okay? Thank you. I, am, uh, I actually have a book on Buddhism, okay? So okay. I, I know a little bit about this subject, but I'm, not, I'm by no means uh, a Buddhist. And um, 
the pictures you showed are beautiful pictures of the Himalayas okay, in nature. But as you know, half of this planet, 7 billion people, live in some urban setting. And that right. number is going to increase. People are moving away from uh, this kind of uh, lifestyle right. to the city. So I'm wondering whether mindfulness, how does that work in urban settings? Mm -hmm. Because people uh, are not going to, there are people who are trying to change inside, as, as you uh, clearly are, but there are people who refuse to change, mm -hmm. who protect their system of capitalist economics, yep. who won't, who will defend it until <coughs> the death. Yes. So it seems to me that the critic in me seems to say that Buddhism is a kind of a withdrawal from resistance. It's a withdrawal from remaking the world. So how does as someone who practices mindfulness, how does one respond to that kind of very harsh uh, question? I was brought up as a Buddhist, but I'm more of a yogi. But um, there's also a concept in Buddhism, it's called engaged Buddhism, mm -hmm. where it, you're not trying to withdraw yourself mm -hmm. from the society, but rather you're trying to engage secularly but you're trying to apply Buddhist philosophies and principles into your life. Um, and so, it's, I think just by bringing in mindfulness into your life, whether you're in the urban or nature, you bring a lot more um, calmness, happiness, and peace into your life. It could help, in fact, a lot of people in Silicon Valley are using Buddhism and mindfulness as a way to hack growth, to perform better in workplaces. Um, which is actually not the true intention of um, yeah, Buddhism initially. But of course there are good effects that come from it. And I think, just like yoga, there's a lot of people practicing yoga everywhere, but not everyone goes down that funnel of becoming more um, conscious about the environment or becoming more spiritual. But it is a funnel. You first you get people from all these different places, and eventually some people would get into that funnel and slowly go down the, the path. And so as a yoga teacher, I... I really emphasize that um, it's not about the asanas or the, the poses that you do that matter. It's more of how you feel in those poses that matter. Because um, you want to go deep inside and not just stay on the physical all the time. Else you would just be doing the same as running or, or any other sports. Um, so mindfulness, you can, just, you can actually take it out from the Buddhist concept and use it um, to your own personal means or, or gains. But there's a lot of people also moving to nature, like in um, Byron Bay in Australia. People are giving up a lot of their jobs because it's not making them happy, and they move to places to plant, um, to farm again, and they're building communities around these places. Yeah. Not sure if I answered. Well, I'm, I'm, forgive me, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I can add a comment, you say, um, and by no means also, I probably don't know. I definitely don't know as much as you do about uh, mindfulness, Buddhism, and so, uh -huh. and so on. But when you said use the word withdrawal, right? And I see it as a means of deeper connection, mm -hmm. completely opposite, without even having to go somewhere in nature mm -hmm. to create. Of, I, the way I see it, mm -hmm. it maybe creates uh, an environment mm -hmm. where you are more likely. Right? To understand yes. things, to look deeper within and so on, to create that connection. Right? Yes. As opposed when you are in Tokyo and you're rushing and you're on the train, right? It's mm -hmm. much harder. Mm -hmm. So I think probably that's why, right? Maybe yep. so many people go in two places like that because it's just easier. Mm -hmm. But then, whether you do that or not, I think such practices, wherever you try them, wherever you engage with them, they do create more mm -hmm. connection. <laughs> whether to self or to your environment, your community, people around the environment, yeah. I mean, natural environment, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I would say that the withdrawal would be the withdrawal from the ego self. Mm. And by withdrawing from the ego self, you're actually more connected to people around you. So um, one disclaimer here, though, um, that I'm concerned about our own project is that we're bringing a lot of people from everywhere to Ladakh, where they can experience flow and bring good things back to their country. But we are aware that people are taking flights to the dark, which is contributing to carbon emission. And so we have to calculate the carbon credit or um, that we have to pay back in the future, planting more plants and, and things to, to make up for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a quick note. <coughs> the program of social responsible tourism that you're yeah. doing, it's very similar to a group called Mad Travel in uh -huh. the Philippines. 
And one smart thing they did that you might consider doing is they got the Philippine government to kind of like promote them, showcase them. Uh -huh. um, since they're an NGO, they're paying a little bit of taxes in the Philippines. And um, recently at the ASEAN Center in Tokyo, they were there. So if you get the Indian government behind you, because right. you're bringing tourists to India, basically. Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's good for India, it's a good uh, publicity. So a little government sponsorship could uh, go a long way. Yep. Okay. And I'll tell you later about mad travel. Okay, it's thank you. Very similar. All right. All right. Well, if that's okay with everybody, I think we'll, we'll move on to the next sure. speaker. So, thank round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.